ahead and turn to Romans chapter 6. I really do appreciate your, your elders and the, the kind of um, invitation to come. I always enjoy uh, the opportunity to preach anywhere there's a, a chance, anywhere where there's a, a listening ear or two or more, um, but always enjoy uh, opportunities in gospel meetings, just to get to meet new people, to go to new places. I've never been to Lakeland before, my first time being here, and so uh, always good to go to, to new places. Um, one of the, uh, the difficult parts about working this week, putting the lessons together this week, and, and certainly putting together some slideshows, um, I had to show remarkable personal restraint in not just simply littering all the slideshows with pictures of my brand new granddaughter. Because I am here to tell you that that's all I wanted to put on the slideshows to show you fine people all week was that sweet little girl. But we're, uh, we're here to talk about Jesus and not about Eliza Kate, even though I would love to tell you all about Eliza Kate. If you want to know about her, I'll tell you about her uh, later. Um, when we're looking in uh, Romans chapter 6, it's very much a, a transitional chapter in this discussion, but it's, it's interesting. A lot of people who look at the book of Romans and a lot of people who try to figure out uh, this Christian walk and try to figure out what it is that God wants for us, a lot of times they seem to ignore chapter 6. A lot of people will look at chapter 5 and uh, as it begins and tell us that we are justified by faith, that we have peace with God through Jesus Christ by faith in Christ Jesus, and then they neglect the, the concept of baptism. This whole week we're going to be looking at raised in Christ, the idea of what God does, the powerful working of God in taking a sinner, washing them clean, and then raising them again to walk in new life. But we are not raised in isolation. We are raised in Christ. We are part of the body of Christ. And so we want to look at that, and, and this morning I want us to specifically look at that point at which we are joined together with Christ, but then what happens after? Because one of the, one of the things that I, I think we need to take great care in avoiding, we will uh, rightly identify uh, philosophies and theologies that wrongly teach that once you are saved, once you are in grace, that you cannot fall from grace. The Bible doesn't teach such a thing. But we also need to be very careful that we are not guilty of teaching something that is parallel to that and in teaching a concept that once you are baptized, you're always saved. Because likewise, that is not true either. And so we need to look at this and, and understand what that means. What is the resurrected life? All right, so we're going to look at this here. And, and one of the things that is kind of flowing under the uh, the, the current under the narrative here is a, a ceremony. One thing that would have been very familiar to Paul, would have been very familiar to the, the church in Rome, would have been familiar to people throughout the Roman Empire. I'm going to uh, throw out a word here, and I just want to see who, who knows what the word means. What does manumission mean? Anyone ever heard that? I didn't realize it was going to be a vocabulary test when you come to Sunday school this morning, right? Anyone ever heard that term? It is the freedom given to a slave. It is that moment, it is that ceremony in the Roman culture when someone transitioned from slavery to freedom. And that, that moment in time was marked. It was a, a, a big event, as you could well imagine. And the, uh, the slave was brought in, literally in chains, and was set down onto an anvil or another hard surface, and the, there was a striking of the chain. And at the instant the chain was struck, that man had a new status in the Roman Empire. He was free. One of the things that Paul teaches us in the book of Galatians, he said, it is for freedom that you have been set free. When you think about that idea and the freedom that we have in Christ, what comes to your mind? What does it mean that for freedom we have been set free? We were slave in, in, in bondage. We were enslaved to sin. For freedom, you have been set free. What does that mean? Just, just generally. Okay.
okay? For what purpose? Is for, that, that's, but what is, what is, how are we to act now newly washed like him? Absolutely. We were set free for a purpose, toward a, a greater uh, purpose. All right, so let's, let's draw our attention now to some, uh, some things in the, uh, the narrative there in chapter 6. And I want us to begin there in, in uh, the first couple of verses because this gets to that issue of the nature of the grace uh, in which we now live. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? May it never be. By no means. This can't be the case, Paul is telling us. And you think about the idea there that's, that's being talked about. People haven't changed much. Because what was happening here is what happens to us. It's what happens in my brain. Because I'm told that I've got you know, this, this brand new clean slate and I've, I'm free to go now do whatever I want to. And I think back on mom and dad and all these things and getting caught doing something and the punishment was given to me and all of a sudden, okay, you can go back outside and play now. It's like, woo! But I'm not just set forth in the world to just go, woo! and just go live any way I want to and go back and make more mistakes and go back out in the yard and do the same thing. But that's what people tend to do. That's our natural inclination. God wouldn't have spent so much time teaching us to resist that temptation as a Christian if it were not a problem. And you can imagine what these, these people were trying to sell then and, and I think what a lot of the religious world tries to sell now. And that's this. You've been saved by grace. You have been freed from sinning. Now you can go. You can't lose your salvation. That grace will abound. And, and uh, these people were saying, you know, if you want more grace, just sin some more. I don't know what, what y'all have around here. There's a great big old place up there in, in Tallahassee. I uh, try to avoid it a little bit uh, if I can. But it's a great big old football stadium up there. They tend to occupy it a little bit on Saturday. But you can imagine what we could do to that place on Sunday if we sold a message like that. If you want to be pleasing to God, if you want to really enjoy your salvation, go sin some. There's plenty of opportunities up there to sin. I imagine there are down here too. What kind of a crowd could you draw? I would imagine folks would come streaming in but we're not saved in order to sin. We are not washed clean to go and get dirty again. Peter talks about dogs returning to their vomit. We all have seen that. It's gross. It's disgusting. But then in that same way, a sinner who is that blind, once they're clean, they go right back to where they were before. And Paul says, you can't be that way. We can't be that way. So here's what, uh, what he tells us. Let's uh, drop down to verse 12. We're going to kind of come back and uh, and pick up a little bit more. But he says, uh, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present yourself, present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments to righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you were not under law but under grace. What does it mean to be a slave to righteousness? I think we all understand what it means to be a slave to sin. What does it mean to be a slave to righteousness? I thought we were set free in Christ. What's he talking about being back in bondage again? The, to, to strive to constantly do right? It's a battle? Absolutely. Absolutely. Why, why servants? Why bond servants? Why slaves again? Why do we get that language back? I thought I was set free. Have you really thought about that? Almost seems kind of confusing in a way. But the word that he chose is one that, that has meaning. Words mean things. But this one has meaning. And I think we need to understand it in their context as well as uh, in ours. This whole concept brings up a lot of uh, emotions, memories, certainly in this country and certainly in this part of the country. It has the, uh, the historical baggage to it. But a slave in, in uh, the, the Greek culture, in, in the word that he chose here, um, is a doulos. A doulos in, their, in that context was a servant who was wholly devoted to a master. Now, 
a servant of sin is wholly devoted to the mastery of that sin. Your sin has dominion over you in that situation. But one who is wholly devoted to the master, one who is wholly devoted to Christ, is a different animal. It is about changing our allegiance. Let's go back to that manumission thing. The way it worked in the Roman Empire was this. When you go and you lay those chains down and they are struck and you are now free, what do you do next? Because if you just go walking out that door and you go and make your own way in the world, you're still going to have to find someone to serve. You're still going to have to find a way to make a living. You're still going to have to find a way to make a life. And one of the things that the, the Roman system offered that Paul is, is dealing here, that slave, once freed, now has to find a new master and commit to a new master. They're free. They're going to get, they're going to get paid for this. It's a different arrangement. But there was an expectation that they would transition. And that's what Paul is trying to get us to see here. We're not set free from sin to go and live our own lives and go and, and live our lives our own way. What happens when I go and live life on my terms? What happens? I go back to the same way. You obviously don't think I'm very strong, do you? I ought to be able to have all the, you know, enough inner fortitude, enough strength out here. If, if I got a clean slate and God has washed, washed my sins away, I ought to be able to go back out there and get it right this next time. Amen. Ought to be. You want to have any luck with that? Because I'm not. Sin is still there. Sin is always going to be there. Sin is why we need Jesus. And we need him prior to being cleansed. We need him prior to being raised. But we need him all the more after we have been raised. And if we are raised in Christ, then we are new creatures, uh, is what we're told. All right, so how does that work? How do we find that uh, here? Let's go back to the beginning of this chapter here and look uh, for just a moment. Uh, in telling them that you can't continue to live in sin once you have been saved. It says, do you not know, in verse 3, that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, notice Paul's the one that brought this up, I didn't, all who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. All right, I want us to kind of think about that. Do you not know all of you who have been baptized? Who's Paul talking to in this letter? Who is this addressed to originally? The Christians in Rome. He is assuming baptism. We're going to see that again everywhere we're looking with Paul. He's writing to people who are already Christians. They are already uh, the recipients of the grace of God. They have been washed. They have been translated or transferred into the kingdom of God's beloved Son in whom there is the forgiveness, in whom there is that cleansing. They've all been washed. And he's saying, don't you know that all of you that have been washed, this is what God did when you presented yourself for baptism. This is what God did, in essence, when you presented yourself for manumission, to be freed from the bondage of that sin. But it says you were baptized into his death. And that's an interesting point to make there because he goes down to verse 5 and says, you've been united with him in death. That word united means to be planted together or intertwined. One of the things that my mom used to like in, in, to have in her office was a ficus tree. Anybody had a little ficus shrub tree and, or whatever? What, is, what do you do with a ficus to make them look really cool? Here's the, you braid them. They're intertwined together. It's still just one plant, isn't it? This says that we are intertwined with Christ. We're united with Christ in his death. This is the point at which we transition from slavery to sin to freedom in Christ. This is that point of manumission. Now let's think through this for just a minute. Y'all going to have to help me on this, all right? When Jesus was brought for his trials before he was crucified, and they were beating him and mistreating him and mocking him and spitting on him. Was he alive or was he dead? 
He was alive. All right, so when, when they, they put the, the robe on him and the crown of thorns on him and presented him side by side with Barabbas and offered everyone a choice, was he alive or dead? He was alive. When he was carrying that cross and, and collapsed under its own weight as he was going up to Calvary, was he alive or was he dead? He was alive. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, alive or dead? He was alive. When his body was taken down off the cross, was he alive or dead? He was dead. When he was laid in the tomb, was he alive or dead? Dead. When the tomb was rolled away, was Jesus alive or was he dead? He was alive. Where was Jesus when life returned to his body in the grave? Where are you? Where was I? Where is any sinner who presents himself to God when life returns in the grave? It is in baptism. It is at that moment. Uh, in essence, symbolically, the hammer hits down on those chains and they fall away at that moment. We are baptized into his death. We are united with him in his death. It doesn't occur before your baptism, salvation doesn't occur after your baptism. It is precisely in that moment, in the grave, when life returns to the dead sinner. All right, so we have a, a baptism like his. We have a burial like his, but it also says there we're going to have a resurrection like his. Now, there's a future resurrection coming. But what about between then and now? What does that resurrection look like? What does the walk in newness of life look like? Paul answers that question for us very well, but he also tells us that he, what it doesn't look like. So before we, we see what it looks like in the book of Romans, let's see some more things about what it doesn't look like. Let's go back in uh, verse 15 of chapter 6. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? Again, Paul says the same thing. By no means. May it never be. God forbid. The way I would say it, of course not. It can't be the case. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient doulos, a slave wholly devoted to a master, if you present yourselves for your full devotion to them. You are slaves of the one to whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to that standard of teaching or to that form of doctrine to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves Dulos is wholly devoted to righteousness. All right, let's think back through that just a, a little bit. Obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching, to a form of doctrine. It literally is the, the word there that is used in the making of a coin. When you take a die that has the negative imprint and you strike it, that striking is the image or the standard or the imprint of that teaching. What is the gospel of Jesus Christ the good news in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Paul expresses himself a little bit and tells us what that good news is and he says that it is this good news that was preached to you it's a message this good news that was preached to you but you received it you took it into yourselves and he says that you are going to be or are being saved by this message if you stand in it. If your faith, if you have not believed in vain. So what is this message that's preached? It's very simply this, that Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he was raised again. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5. Paul said, this is the message of first importance. This is what I preach to you. This is what I preach to everybody. This is what he is telling these brethren in Rome that he had never met before. It's Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. All right? 
So if I, the, the baptism is the burial, this form of teaching, I wasn't literally buried. You weren't literally buried. You were obeying a form of teaching. So what's the death part? What do you obey that is the symbol of, his, of the death before the burial? You want to take up your cross? You want to deny yourself? You must die yourself and then follow him. In turning away from sin, in rejecting sin, in understanding the devastation of sin, we change our mind. We turn in our mind. We turn away from God. We turn back, excuse me, turn away from sin and turn back to God. We die to sin. Paul just told us that. How many of you have already died to sin? If you've died to sin, you can't still live in it. So we have the, the death to sin. We have the death to self. What do you do when, when a person is dead? And I know that it's dip, more difficult asking the, the question nowadays. You, nowadays, it more increasingly you answer, they're cremated. My mom was just cremated. In many cases, you have a dead body, they must be buried. You bury them. Just like Jesus was buried after that form, after that standard of teaching, and then we were raised again to walk in newness of life, obeying the death, burial, and resurrection. That is what we are obedient from the heart to. All right? So now we are raised, and now we become uh, slaves of righteousness. All right? What, let's go back to chapter 4. I want to hit on some things pretty quickly, just, just looking at this new walk, this walk in newness of life uh, that we want to... Uh, uh, to explore a little bit. The first thing I would suggest to you that if we pick up in about verse 22 of chapter 4, we're going to see that this is a walk of peace. That apart from Christ, while lost in sin, while being a servant of sin, while being devoted to sin, we're at war with God. I don't care how good you are. And there's some pretty evil folks that have been washed clean and God has transformed them into the likeness of His Son. There's been some pretty good people that have been washed clean of their sins and uh, set free from sin as well. It doesn't matter how good you are or how evil you are, you're still washed clean. You must still be washed and make peace uh, with God. All right, so let's, let's pick up in, in 422. That is why his faith, Abraham's, was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours. Uh, also, it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised uh, from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Therefore, since we have been justified. All right, he, again, he's talking to people who are already Christians. He's talking about people who have already obeyed the, the gospel. He's going to continue that discussion on into chapter 6, but that's who he's talking to. All right, so we have been justified by faith. We have peace. It's a walk of peace. It is a walk of peace with God. So what happens when I start itching and straining and straying and going back into the mire and as a dog returns to his vomit, I go right back to the things I was doing before. Is that a walk of peace? That's a walk of rebellion. That's reinstituting an insurrection of sorts. That's going behind the victorious troops as they sweep through the land, and now I'm going to come back behind them, and I'm going to start just attacking and picking away or whatever. I'm now back at war with God again from the inside. Folks, as Christians, as those who have been washed by the blood of the Lamb, as those who have been freed from sin, who have been set apart for the world to see, who have been uh, made a part of a shining city on the hill, when this world looks at us and they do not see a difference because they're at war with God and we're at war with God just in different ways of sinning, we have a problem. The church has a problem. Jesus has a problem, and I, in that problem, if I re-engage 
in that death. We have peace by the blood of the cross. Colossians 1 in verse 20. Jesus said that peace that he gives is not like the world gives, but is of a divine origin. And he said that he would be with us to, to walk that walk. All right, so we have peace with God. Let's also see the, the very next thing. See what happens when that, uh, that comes full bloom. Through him in verse 2, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that our suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. What is hope? What is biblical hope? When you die, are you going to heaven? Evidence of things not seen It is the the uh, substructure, the foundation of things that are, are not seen? Yes, sir. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hope does not disappoint, but hope is also not just wistful either. It is an expectant desire. Do you expect to go to heaven when you die? And you can't say, I hope so, because you're being redundant. That hope is an expectation. Is that expectation because of how awesome I am? Is that expectation is because of how good you are? Why, why do you have an expectation of heaven? It's because of Christ. It's because of Christ. It is what he has done. It is the power that he has accomplished. It is a walk of peace, but it's also a walk of hope. We have an anchor to the soul. I tell you what, if, if that anchor is cast into eternity and that hope is my anchor for my soul, I'm lashed to the presence of God. I am a servant of righteousness, serving him, serving Christ all my days, but I am guided and governed and encouraged and bolstered by hope. All those troubles and turmoils and sufferings and all these things, it produces endurance in us. How? I can make it through this because all I want out of this is heaven. It produces endurance. It will not disappoint. He goes on and picking up in verse 17, we see here this grace in which we stand. And he's also mentioned, this is a walk of grace. This is a walk because of our reconciliation with Christ Jesus. Um, let's pick up in verse 11. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for many died through one man's trespass. Much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace through that one man, Christ Jesus, abounded for the many, and the free gift is not like the result of one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, by one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteous, or righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. The walk in newness of life is a walk in grace. How then do we differentiate between that, that idea, I'm free from sin, therefore the more, more I go in sin, the more grace I get. How do we differentiate between that and the fact that all sin, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but John tells us that if we are in Christ, if we are walking in the light as he is in the light, if we continue in that fellowship with God and that fellowship with other people, we still sin. How do we 
differentiate? How do we thrive in grace? How do we walk in grace? And balance those two. How is this a grace that I stand in? How is this a grace that I walk in? I'm not looking for anything deep and theological here. This is a very human question. Yes, ma'am. Right. Certainly. Certainly. What about in the decision to sin? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Well, people have that idea that, well, you know, Jesus and I, we've got this set of things and so on. You've, heard, you've met those people, too. Oh, I'm still waiting for my side deal. <laughs> yes, ma'am. All right. It, yes, in, in, and I agree wholeheartedly, and that's a good distinction to bring up, in that uh, once uh, the, those outside of Christ are sinners, and that would be the practicing of sin, now we are saved who happen to sin. Uh, a very good distinction to draw there. Yes, sir. Certainly. How does willful sin factor into this? That's right. All right, here's the, here's the thought process. Hold your thought right there. Here's the thought process that we have to avoid. You make a calculation. It's very easy to do. I, I remember doing it when I was a kid. It usually involved my dad's belt as the, the, the penalty here. But I was thinking, you know, if I do this and I get caught, I'm going to get a spanking. I knew that just as surely as I, I could know anything. For, I, I've told some of you this. My dad is a retired Marine Corps colonel. I got spankings, but I could make a choice. I could go through that thought process, but if I do this and I get away with it, I'll try it again. All right, now what if the thought process for sin goes something like this? I'm a sinner saved by grace. I am now free from sin. Therefore, I can do this, and God's going to forgive me anyway. What's the problem with that? Y'all have already told me that God forgives us while we're, already, while we're Christians. See, this is y'all's fault. Y'all are teaching me the wrong thing here. Willfully. That's exactly right. It's that thought process. The walk in grace is that thought process. Is not making a, a determination, not making a choice because of grace. And it will wash my sins away but making that choice and making that determination that because of Jesus' great sacrifice, I choose not to. Yes, sir? Certainly. Absolutely. Precisely. I like that. Right. You're either um, with the Lord or you're against the Lord. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Were you just agreeing? All right. It's also a walk of life. We're raised to walk in new life. So many people that you would look around and you say, if that is what the Christian life is, where's the life that I mentioned? Life. 
We're raised for a great purpose. And it is not to present ourselves to the world in a way where it just brings them down and saying, you know what, I'm having a whole lot more fun doing what I'm doing than these folks. They don't seem happy. There's, the, there's no joy. What's wrong? We need to make sure that we understand that this is a, uh, we are saved to vitality. That we are saved to walk in new life. And that walk is imitating Jesus. That walk is um, a walk of righteousness. Back in, the, in chapter 6 there, uh, where it says that this, uh, in, in presenting ourselves in verse 19, uh, as slaves to righteousness, it leads us to sanctification. What does sanctification mean? Separation. Absolutely. What's another word or, or some other words for this idea of sanctification? Um, holiness. Absolutely. What is the biblical term for one who is holy? A saint. A saint is a holy one, a sanctified one, one who is set apart. We're going to talk about that some, uh, some, uh, some more tonight uh, in the, the evening hour. But this walk is a walk of separation, separation from the world, a continued walk of distancing ourselves from the world around us. If we have been united with Christ in a death like His, we've died to sin. If we have been united with Christ, intertwined with Christ, planted together with Christ to then burst forth and bloom, but we must be different. Come out from among them, God said, and be separate. It's not about isolation. It's not about going out and, and, uh, and, and finding a convent to join or a monastery to join or going and building a, a, an encampment in the jungle somewhere down in South America and just trying to get away from everybody else. That can't be it. But there must be a separation of ourselves and our lives and our actions. Because we're going to be all around people who are servants and are slaves to sin all day long. How do we handle it? How do we make it? By separating from the world, we draw closer to God. By separating out, by being separated out and being washed and cleansed and then set up on a pedestal as a light, a light for the world to see. A shining city on a hill that cannot be hidden. But that this process of setting us free, this process of separation, makes us the church, the ecclesia, the called out assembly. We're called out of this mess that was going to cost us our soul in the first place. And we are added to the body of Christ, the church of Christ, the kingdom of Christ, the vine that is Christ. We are taken out of where we were and we are placed in the body just as God sees fit. And when part of the body rebels, when part of the body rejects, wants to go back to the old way, then we have, um, have a problem. All right, so let's, let's finish out the, the chapter here, and then the, uh, the lesson will, will be yours. For when you were once slaves of sin, in verse 20, you were free in regard to righteousness. Apart from Christ, you could do whatever you wished to do. All right, there's a penalty there, but you were free. Free to make those choices. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you were now ashamed. Lee's translation, where did that get you? Where did that fun life of sin, where did the pleasure of sin for a season get you? Pain and heartache, absolutely. For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification, leads to holiness 
and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin. Anybody have a job? No, y'all don't work? <laughs> I'm moving to Lakeland. Uh, your wife is your boss, okay. If you put in 40 hours for an employer, what do you get at the end of that week? You get paid. You get a check, right? Did you earn it? Hopefully you did. All right, theoretically, if you did all the things you were hired to do and you did them in an acceptable way to, to your boss and you met whatever standard he had put before you, if you work those 40 hours, he's going to write you a check for however many hours uh, times uh, your agreed upon wage. You earned it. Salvation is not like that. It's not an earning. It's a free gift. One of the things that this world hurls at God as they shake their fist at God is the ability to, or the inability to believe that a loving God could condemn people to an everlasting hell. And people try to sort that out, and many people reject God on that basis alone. I stand here to tell you that God is not going to condemn anybody to hell. Anybody shocked with me saying that? You condemn yourself. If I end up going to hell, if I end up losing my soul for all of eternity, I have earned it. That was the wage. That was part of the corrupt bargain with this world that I made when I sinned that first time. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift, can you earn a free gift? No. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. I can't earn heaven. I absolutely can earn hell. And we need to be able to present God, and we need to be able to present the Christ of God. We need to be able to show Jesus to this world in a way that expresses all of that. But the very first way that we express that great truth to the world around us is by walking in newness of life as a raised child of God, washed clean from our sins, set apart from the world, but set apart for the world to see and to hear and to follow us to Christ Jesus himself. All right, are there any closing thoughts, comments, questions, concerns? Don't go leaving out of here saying, Brother Lee taught us that there's no hell. I hope you're recording this. You all know that I did not say that. All right, I appreciate y'all's kind attention very much. I think we're about a minute away from the, the final bell. How about that? The, don't tell the people at Timberlane that I can finish the lesson early because they will begin <laughs> expecting it more and more often. But I, I appreciate it. I just think your clock's wrong is what it is. That's, that's Thank you all very much.